supplementary. We now move on to questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel. Additional revenue of up to 30 million to 35 million could be raised through introducing the rating of empty commercial premises at 100%, including empty factories. Those figures assume that other features of non-domestic vacant rating remain intact, such as the minimum valuation cap of 2,000 and the three-month initial exemption to allow owners to let a property once it becomes vacant. I say up to because the introduction of such a measure could have unintended effects here given the proportion of vacant properties compared to other parts of the United Kingdom and the relative weakness of the property market here. These effects could include many property owners taking steps to avoid liability through rendering their property incapable of being let or by encouraging charities to take up occupation. These matters are amongst the issues my department is consulting on at present as part of the review of the non-domestic rating system. Can I thank the Minister for her answer? Do, but does the Minister believe that by doing away with the 50 per cent relief for empty businesses premises there would be a downward pressure on rents charged by landlords? No, I don't, because I think there may be other consequences uh, that would happen, as I indicated uh, I think some landlords would take uh, precipitative action to make sure that they wouldn't have to pay 100% uh, rates. They would um, maybe destroy their premises or indeed uh, let it out in, in other fashions. Um, so I actually think the way in which we've handled uh, non-domestic vacant rating uh, is a balanced uh, way forward. We are saying to the landowners that we are, 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 that we are going to charge them uh, rates. Uh, however, we are recognising the difficulties of the property market here in Northern Ireland by saying to them that we're only going to charge it uh, at 50 per cent. And in many cases, 50 per cent rates um, on non-domestic properties are it's not insubstantial, uh, Mr. Speaker. And that money really is dead money to uh, the landlord, but yet he still has to pay it. Uh, and I think if we were to increase it to 100 per cent, as indeed has been the case uh, in England uh, and Wales, uh, I think it would be uh, a very difficult um, uh, amount of money to recover in many instances. Thank you. And it comes to Patsy McGlynn. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the Minister for her answer. She was moving me into the territory that I was going to go there, in that many of our town centre uh, shops are vacant because of the critically high rates uh, in those town centres, and many of our businesses find those extremely difficult to sustain. So, would the Minister agree with me that would, it would be a detrimental move for those businesses, particularly in town centres, that we're hoping to revive and hoping to get people back into those premises, if you were to add another 50 per cent, or in some, depending on what it may be that Mr McMullen has in mind with his anti-business proposal, that it would be really detrimental to those town centres and would act as no catalyst for the development of those town centres. I agree with the member. I, I think that the business organisations would frankly be appalled at any suggestion that I would uh, move to have a 100 per cent rates on non-domestic vacant properties because a lot of them struggle at the moment to pay the 50 per cent and indeed many of them are looking for other sorts of rebates. Um, he mentions the town centres. I've had some very useful conversations recently um, with some of the Chamber of Commerce uh, in relation to what else we can do uh, to help those town centres, how we can be innovative, how we can move forward. And, uh, I, I think that the uh, review that is ongoing at this present moment in time has actually initiated a lot of thought. Um, and I welcome that and I look forward to meeting with other groups to see what else it is we can bring forward, because uh, one of the more innovative uh, proposals put forward to me is in relation to window dressing and having rates rebates because of the fact that the window is dressed. And that came forward from, from Newry, from the Buttercrane Shopping Centre. It's only a small element, but it's something additional for those people who are there. And I'm hoping to bring that forward in the, in the Rates Amendment Bill, which I hope will come to the House very soon. 
I call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I too thank the, the Minister for answers today and do welcome the on -viewing, ongoing review of commercial rates. Can the Minister give us some assurance that, in relation to uh, extending the rates concession to recently vacated properties, has she looked at that option? Yes, I have looked at that option, and again, as I've indicated, uh, I'm looking at all of these options at the moment to see how we can make a real difference uh, to some of those town centres. Uh, he will recall that it was after a meeting with uh, business organisations that my predecessor brought in the Small Business Rates Relief, um, something that has been, I think, a great enabler for town centres and has helped many, many businesses stay afloat during some difficult times. Uh, we're looking at that whole area at the moment to see what else we can do uh, to help businesses. And whilst it's not necessarily, Mr. Speaker, the role of my department to be uh, in the lead in that area to help town centres, I do think that we can assist. And therefore, we will work with DSD and with DETI to see if there's anything we can do in that regard. Mr. Martin and Bill. Thanks to the Minister. I wonder, Minister, following on from that, uh, you mentioned uh, ch the charity shops or landlords being able to avoid business rates by uh, letting to a charity shop, which of course doesn't pay rates. Have you been given much thought to that? And is that, is that a loophole being used by landlords? Are we end up with too many charity shops in our, in our high streets, as it were? And is there something that can be done in this rates review to tackle that? Well, it is a subject matter that has already come up in the consultation, I think it's fair to say. Um, directly with myself and indeed through um, responses to the department. Uh, I have to say I don't think all landlords are using it as a way of ex escaping rates liability. There are some very good charity shops that provide a function and a service to the community. They're open regular hours, they're open every day and they do provide that service. Uh, I've seen some other examples where that's not the case and where the charity shop might be open for a limited number of hours on one day a week, and by doing that they have avoided uh, rates liability. So I think we will have to look at that in more detail, um, uh, and certainly it is something that has been raised with me by many town centre operators that they feel very aggrieved by the fact that people can avoid rates uh, by using charity shops exemptions, but there are others who are really providing a service. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I think one of the problems with non-domestic rates is actually the net annual value. Um, can the minister give me um, any of her thoughts on how she uh, intends to review um, how we evaluate properties? Of course, um, that's how we decide how much rates are levied against each individual property. Uh, the Land and Property Service have a very uh, regulated way of doing that to work out what the NAV should be for a particular street and for a particular property, and I'm sure that they would be happy to go through that uh, with the member if she would find that useful. Um, do we need to look at the mechanism for NAV? I'm quite happy to look at that in the consultation. I want this to be a wide-ranging consultation, something that goes right to the very heart of what's going on. And if she has any ideas, um, for example, as to other mechanisms as to how people should be levied in terms of the rates, well, maybe we should look at that as well, and I'm open to that. And I call Mr. Michael McJimson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number two. The Stormont Agreement document set out the Executive's plans to establish an independent fiscal council for Northern Ireland. It is envisaged that the Council will prepare annual assessments of the Executive's revenue streams, spending proposals and the overall sustainability of the Executive's public finances. A growing number of fiscal councils are being established around the globe, particularly in the advent of the economic downturn. In seeking to determine the detailed terms of reference for the Independent Fiscal Council for Northern Ireland, I will draw on the national and international evidence of what works best to ensure those lessons can be applied and arrangements are put in place that suit Northern Ireland. Mr. McGimsey for a supplement. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And can uh, the Minister explain what lessons she believes can be learned from the operation of the Office of Budget Responsibility in Westminster, in particular about managing uh, the budget? and in particular about dealing with issues around so-called uh, financial black holes and uh, borrowing through the consolidated fund in, in emergency fashion. 
We should be looking not just at the uh, OBR, but indeed at other uh, independent fiscal councils that have been set up recently. Um, the Irish Republic has a fiscal council, Scotland has a fiscal council, and we should have a look at all of those to decide what's most applicable uh, to us here in Northern Ireland. I think that uh, the fiscal council will add uh, a degree of transparency, uh, independence to our fiscal plans it doesn't interfere at any, in any way with what we do as an executive in terms of driving the economy forward. And indeed, it is up to us to set uh, the budget. But it will aid with the transparency of the budget, and I think in that way it will be very helpful. I call Mr. Jim Allis. Um, I think I welcome the fiscal council, particularly if it's a break on profligacy and fantasy budgets and such matters, and the fact that its membership and its terms of reference have to be approved by the Treasury, presumably, uh, is good. But could you just amplify a little more in terms of comparing and contrasting it with the Office of Budget Responsibility? Is it a devolved structure of that sort by another name, or is it something different from that? First of all, can I welcome the fact that Mr. Allister has welcomed something in this House today? I think it's a red-letter day for uh, the Assembly. Um, it's, it, it's not going to be akin to the Office of Budget Responsibility and a devolved mechanism. It's an independent fiscal council uh, set up probably of small membership, I would imagine around three or four people, um, people with expertise in the area. Uh, as he rightly says, the um, it will, its terms of reference have to be agreed with Her Majesty's Treasury, but it will be done in conjunction uh, with my own department. So it will aid, I think, in terms of transparency, in terms of uh, giving the public more information about the budget process. Um, just last week I had a meeting with my Ministerial Advisory Council and we were uh, discussing how we could uh, engage more with society and more with the public in relation to budgetary matters and to have a better understanding as to what happens with public money and how that public money is spent. Uh, so I think it will aid in all of those ways, Mr Speaker, and I think it should be welcomed by the House. Minister, I hope it's a two-way street and the Independent Fiscal Council asks you for some advice as well, and no doubt you, you will give it, but can you just confirm to me that while they will advise, it will be yourself as Minister and the Executive which really will take the decisions ultimately? Absolutely. Um, the Fiscal Council is there to advise and to aid and to maybe, dare I say, shine a light uh, in relation to what happens here uh, in Stormont. Uh, we will set the budget, we will set the trajectory, and uh, they can uh, comment uh, and, and talk about the issues that we raise. But uh, very much uh, power still rests within the executive. Thank you. And before we move on, can I inform members that questions 7 and 8 have been withdrawn? And I call Mr Gordon Lyon. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Question 3. And with your permission, Mr Speaker, I will answer questions 3, 5 and 13 together. The UK Spending Review and Autumn Statement will see the Northern Ireland resource Dale fall in real terms by 5% by 2019-20. This is in spite of receiving some 1.1 billion consequentials from funding for health services in England. The capital budget fares much better, with conventional capital set to rise by 12% in real terms by 2020-2021. Although reducing financial transactions capital will still make up to uh, 410.8 million of our overall capital deal funding over the period. The Chancellor's decision on tax credits means that the Executive will now have to take decisions on how to best utilise the funding set aside for the mitigating measures. For thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, further to that, would the Minister be able to outline the process uh, for producing a budget for the 16-17 financial year, and could she also give us an overview of the impact that the spending review will have on departmental budgets? Absolutely. And uh, after the comprehensive spending review announcement on the 25th of November, we now have a clear picture in terms of the block grant over the next uh, four years. Uh, I've indicated a 5% reduction in real terms for resource Dale uh, and a growth, especially towards the latter end, in terms of capital spending. Uh, therefore, we are now uh, going to engage with all of the individual departments. 
I envisage there will be rounds of budget bilaterals between myself and my ministerial colleagues before Christmas, and we will then bring forward uh, a budget to the uh, executive. Now, I do realise that we're not going to have time to have our usual uh, draft budget consultation period. Uh, I have tasked officials to speak with uh, individual stakeholders and indeed groups of stakeholders to discuss the way forward with them once the budget uh, the draft budget comes to the fore after ministerial bilaterals have finished. And then it is uh, the hope that we will have a budget in place, and indeed we need to have a budget in place uh, for the end of January uh, of next year. Uh, although the spending review was uh, perhaps better, uh, particularly in relation to capital, uh, than some people anticipated, there are going to be difficulties for departments. Uh, particularly if we ring fence spending uh, in relation to health, um, because health, of course, is such a big part of the budget here in Northern Ireland. Um, and therefore, uh, uh, colleagues will have to look at uh, efficiency savings again for the year 16 17. And just to be clear, we are only setting a one year budget at this stage, uh, Mr. Speaker, because we do feel it would be wrong to tie the hands of the new mandate after May of next year, who will want to set their own priorities uh, after that. So I hope that's um, clear as to how we're going to move things forward over the next coming weeks. It will be a busy time. Uh, there's a lot to do, but again, challenges for many departments. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I thank the Minister for her answer so far? Um, the Executive has in the past treated these consequentials as unhypothecated. And will the Minister, given, um, I know she's touched on this already, but can I press her to ask, will she press the Executive with the view to ensuring that these monies are used in the health service, given the great need that there is currently in the health service? Uh, and indeed, one of the reasons why we have a, a flat cash situation is because, as I've indicated, we're going to benefit under the Barnett formula to the tune of £1.1 billion pounds in terms of health spending, um, because health and schools have been protected uh, in, uh, in England and Wales. And what that means in actual terms is that in 1617, uh, we will receive £133.1 million pounds extra. Um, and we then, as an executive, have to decide how we are going to use that money. It is, as she rightly says, um, unhypothecated, and therefore it comes to us to decide what to do with the money. Uh, and uh, of course, we as an executive have taken uh, steps to make sure that we do favour the health department, that we do uh, look at it in a very sympathetic way. And I would imagine that we will continue uh, to look at the health department in that way. That's not to say that there shouldn't be efficiencies in the health department, and indeed uh, I'm told by my ministerial colleague that a, a wide range of efficiency saving plans are in place. I look forward to having those discussions with him because whilst I think everyone here wants to see frontline services protected, we do also need to see efficiencies in the health uh, estate right across Northern Ireland. George Robinson. Mr. Speaker, <coughs> could the minister outline what overall impact the autumn statement will have on our health service? Well, as I've indicated, um, if we do uh, decide to protect the health uh, budget, and of course that's not just a matter for me, that's a matter for the whole uh, executive, uh, then we will have to make greater savings uh, in terms of the other departmental budgets. Uh, we have asked um, colleagues, ministerial colleagues, to look at a range of scenarios in terms of their departments. Uh, we will have those discussions at budget bilaterals to see what way we should move forward. But it will be a challenging time, uh, particularly for some of the smaller departments. They have made savings uh, over this past couple of years, uh, but unfortunately, because of the way in which uh, uh, this budget has come to us with uh, a decreasing deal in terms of uh, the relative situation, then we have to plan for that, and uh, we need to do that very quickly. Thank you. And I, get a, I, can't call. Can I ask the Minister, uh, given the British Chancellor's announcement pertaining to tax credits, what discussions will now be taking place at executive level to reach consensus on what is done with this money that was set aside uh, for the needs of the most vulnerable in our society? Absolutely. And, uh, of course, we all uh, welcome the fact that the Chancellor moved away from his plans in relation to tax credits. 
Um, uh, it was always very difficult to understand how you could say that you wanted to encourage people into work uh, and then to actually uh, undermine that argument by taking away tax credits which were there to help them get into that work. So it was, to me, a very sensible decision. We had set aside a pot of money uh, to deal with the consequences of the cut in tax credits uh, under the Fresh Start Agreement. Uh, we will now have to, at an executive level, have those discussions. It's spread over four years, so we have some time to decide um, the profile of that money. It's $60 million in each year. Uh, so we can decide whatever we want to do in relation to the money and how best we can help vulnerable people uh, over that period of time. And I look forward to those discussions in the coming weeks and months. And the call, Mr. Dominic Brown. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answer. Um, is the Minister confirming that she agrees that uh, at least a proportion of the 240 million originally um, set aside for tax credits can now be used to mitigate those most severely affected by welfare changes. I don't think that's what I said at all. <laughs> if he looks back at the Hansard, he will see that I said that we now are in a situation where we have 60 million. Uh, pounds extra that we thought we didn't have because we set it aside out of the block grant to deal with tax credit pressures. That pressure is no longer there. So now I think we should be looking at ways in which we can help uh, the vulnerable in whatever way we use the money, uh, whether we use it in the health department, whether we use it in the education department, do we use it in the welfare department and social development? Those are discussions that we will have and we will have those around the executive table. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'm delighted to hear the Minister speak uh, so often about uh, the, the, the needs of the Health Department. And particularly, she do, continues to use, as does other ministers, the word the most vulnerable in our society. The min Minister will be aware of the bombshell that was created last week about the uh, number of uh, seven, I think it was, home care homes were to be closed by the Four Seasons. Uh, will the Minister confirm that uh, if and when the a health minister comes looking for uh, finance to sustain the most vulnerable. In other words, that the most vulnerable will not be turfed out of their home after so many years. That her uh, minister, her office, will be uh, uh, sympathetic to those requests. Well, I, I'm not going to answer health questions today, but what I will say is I do welcome the fact that uh, at least two of the homes seem to be moving to a situation where others are going to step in and ensure that the homes continue to exist, so I welcome that. I also welcome the fact that my uh, executive colleague, the Health Minister, has uh, called a moratorium in relation to the closure of statutory homes in the meantime uh, until we have an assessment of where we are in relation to elderly care. I have to say, as well as the seven homes uh, that have been earmarked for closure, it does cause uh, a ripple right throughout um, the care system. And whilst no homes were earmarked for closure in the west of the province, I know uh, that I've taken calls from staff. They're very concerned about what might happen as a consequence of the home closures in the east of the province. So it's something that concerns us all at a constituency level, of course. Uh, the care of the elderly and the vulnerable should be uppermost in our minds at all times. Uh, but I will continue to work with the Health Minister in relation to those matters. Question number four, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my department is not introducing legislation to de-rate sporting facilities. However, I intend to bring forward a bill that will enable relief for some categories of community amateur sports club to be increased from 80% to 100%. The bill is drafted, and I have also gained the support of the Finance Committee to progress it through the accelerated passage procedure. Beg for supplement. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for that answer. Maybe the Minister could outline briefly what the benefits to those clubs will be through this new system. Well, indeed, uh, if they do not have a licensed premises on uh, their uh, grounds or in their club, then they will be able to avail of 100% rates relief. Uh, I think that will be wholeheartedly welcomed by those community amateur sports clubs, um, and that is uh, my current intention. The bill, um, which I have discussed with the committee, is going to contain an enabling power that is going to permit enhanced rates relief uh, for sports clubs subject to certain conditions. I 
do want to place on record my thanks to the Finance Committee uh, for the way in which they have dealt with this matter, and I do hope we can have the bill debated uh, in the House very, very soon. Much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her commitment there. Minister, when you're bringing forward that regulation, could you also give a commitment to look at the prescribed recreations that are set out in the Rates Recreational Hereditaments Order of 2007 for the potential including pigeon racing? Well, I, I think I've already answered uh, uh, Mr. Schwann in relation to that issue in a written question, uh, so I'll refer him to that answer. Thank you. And I'll call Mr. Basil. Uh, would the Minister outline uh, why there would be any difference between sports facilities getting rate relief and arts facilities? Because uh, I'm dealing with community amateur sports clubs, um, and they have come forward. They have made a request. Uh, they have made a very effective lobby. I have listened to that lobby, as indeed have many in this House. This is not something new. This goes back to, I think it's the time of my predecessor, Mr Wilson, uh, who first was engaged in this issue. Uh, and therefore, uh, it shouldn't come as a surprise to the member that this is the way in which we're moving. And I call Ms. Megan Ferrin. Good. Question six, please. I have not had any meetings with sports clubs in relation to the subordinate legislation associated with my proposed rates amendment bill. It is currently premature to do so, but my department will be consulting in the new year when the bill is underway at the Assembly. This will not only be with sports bodies, however, it will also include important stakeholders who were overlooked when the failed private members' bill was taken forward, including business organisation, land and property services and other departments with a direct interest in the matter. I can advise, however, that my lead official on rating policy has already met with representatives from the Sports Forum and the Federation of Licensed Clubs in relation to the matter and will be meeting them again during the consultation period. On Ms. Ferrin for a supplement. Uh, Gordon, thank the Minister for her answer. I'm sure the Minister is aware that the Finance Committee have had some constructive sessions with the, both the hospital, hospitality sector and amateur clubs. Um, and in light of the, the bill having been blocked, does she agree that there may be a compromise on the bars issue, given that the sector aren't adverse to that? And will she uh, pledge to work with the committee on the issue? Well, of course, I, I will continue to work with the committee on the issue, and as I've indicated, I'm very pleased that we've been able to process uh, the bill to the stage that it's currently at. It's in the Office of First and Deputy First Minister uh, for clearance. Um, I haven't had the opportunity, I think it was just last week, uh, that the meeting took place with the hospitality sector uh, in terms of the committee hearing, so I look forward to reading what they had to say in relation to the matter. And as I say, the consultation period will run parallel uh, to the bill being introduced in the Assembly and we will have the opportunity to look at whether any amendments can be made at that stage. Thank you. And we move on to Mr Basil McRae. Question number nine, Mr Speaker. The Executive will agree its priorities for the allocation of financial transactions capital next year through the upcoming budget process. McRae for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Minister, I understand that FTC is in effect a loan. I wonder what... Uh, procedures are in place for the repayment of a loan, who is it repaid to and how is that accounted for in the budget and the accounts? Well, the, the good thing about financial transactions capital is that the, it does not score against uh, capital Dale. It's a separate stream of money that comes to us uh, from uh, Westminster. And in that regard, it doesn't score, as I said, uh, uh, in terms of our borrowings, because it's actually taken forward by uh, third parties. And he will recall that recently, uh, when we were talking about the November monitoring, uh, that I had indicated that a large sum of money has gone to uh, the co-ownership housing and that money has gone to Queen's University as well. And therefore, that is the mechanism by which the money is paid back, not through uh, DFP. It's actually taken off the books, as it were. Well, Mr Conor Murphy, and I'm afraid I'll not have time for supplementary. <laughs> Just my luck. Cash, uh, Ivra Jay, Cancora, question number 10. It is very difficult to estimate the amount of rate revenue that would be generated, as that will not only depend on the number of new jobs created, but also the sectoral mix, the nature of those jobs, and the working arrangements. But by way of illustration, 100 new office jobs could potentially generate up to £80,000 a year in rates if we assume that those jobs are housed in the new Grade A office space. However, it would not be advisable to simply extrapolate that figure, given the variation in the types of jobs we can expect to be created. 
Furthermore, the spin-off service jobs in the area, which boost economic activity, would also need to be factored in, as these would lead to higher level of occupancy and increased rates revenue from existing vacant properties. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and could I ask the Minister that, bearing in mind the huge advantages financially that Northern Ireland gains from being uh, a member of the United Kingdom, why is it that the economy of the Irish Republic is currently estimated to be growing at around three times the rate of the economy in Northern Ireland? Well, first of all, can I say I welcome the fact that the economy of the Republic of Ireland is growing at a fast rate, and I do that in the knowledge that a wide range of our small businesses will have an export market that has been missing uh, for a number of years, and they will very much welcome the fact that they will be able to export into a market that is continuing to grow. I think the global outlook in terms of all economies has been good. Our economy is to grow uh, on projections of about 1.2 per cent, and the Republic of Ireland, he is right, is uh, over 3 per cent. I think 3.6 per cent or somewhere uh, in that, that region. Uh, we have structural issues to deal with. We do not have a lower rate of corporation tax, which of course we are very much looking forward to being able to set in April 2018. And We are working through those structural issues, and I think uh, that we can benefit from being on the island of Ireland, but being in the United Kingdom as well, so we have the best of both worlds. Uh, uh, thank you, Speaker. Yes, I think the latest reports are showing that uh, the Republic's economy is going to be growing around 5.8 per cent, so there's a major differential there between us uh, and the Irish Republic. And it's the question is, what steps are we taking? What steps does she believe or proposals does she believe that we can come forward with to allow Northern Ireland to play catch-up and actually close the gap rather than us lagging behind the Irish Republic? Well, uh, there, were, uh, there was a time when we certainly was, were not lagging by the Irish Republic, and indeed the Republic have had a pretty difficult time over this past five to six years. And if you look at their unemployment statistics, they still are at a rate that is much higher than our unemployment statistics. But they are putting in place, uh, they are a sovereign government, and therefore they can put in place policies to drive their economy forward. And that is why it is critical that we do all really endorse the principle of a lower rate of corporation tax so that we can go out and sell it to the rest of the world and take up all the other advantages that we currently have. The, the other advantages which frankly have allowed us to bring in the best rate of foreign direct investment per head of population uh, in the United Kingdom in 2014. Those are the sorts of statistics we will now should take forward in relation to the corporation tax argument and go into those companies that we haven't been able to access in the past. We can now access them because we have the tax product by April 2018, and that will certainly drive the economy forward. Thank you. And I call Mrs. Sandra Overham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can the Minister update the House on her progress on the Budget 26-27 preparations? Well, maybe not 26-27, but 16-17. Uh, I'm not quite sure I'll be here in 26-27. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> Yes, in terms of the 16-17 budget process, uh, as I've indicated in other substantive answers, uh, we will be having budget bilaterals, hopefully before Christmas, so that we can take the issues forward. It's overland for supplement. Uh, thank you for that, um, and apologies for the slip. I don't know what happened to me there. Um, but um, once again, the assembly will be for will be forced. Uh, to rush through a budget. Does the Minister agree that this is an extremely unfair uh, way uh, to work given the uncertainty that it provides for so many organisations, uh, such as local environment organisations? Well, I don't think it's once again in terms of the budget process, because normally we do have uh, a 12 week consultation period. Uh, we bring out a draft budget, then there's a consultation period, and then we bring forward uh, the budget. I do accept that that's not the case uh, in, in these circumstances. And that is because the comprehensive spending review only came on the 25th of November and of course Westminster uh, is dealing with its own processes and that leaves things very difficult uh, for those of us in the devolved administrations whether we're in Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland. We have to bring forward budgets in a very short time scale. I think it's the right decision not to have a multi-year budget but to have 
a single year budget and because we will have that single year budget uh, we won't be tying the hands of the next mandate uh, for those people who uh, return or indeed the new members to this assembly so that they can set their own priorities. I call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, may I empathise with the Minister regarding the major problems of flood flooding and her constituency of Fermanagh, South Thrun, and indeed other nor uh, areas of Northern Ireland? But could I ask the Minister to outline what forms of support will be offered to owners of premises damaged by the flooding? Well, first of all, can I say uh, uh, I'm, I'm very glad that he's mentioned the flooding issue because indeed my own constituency has suffered disproportionately on this occasion. Uh, many areas which haven't experienced flooding in the past have had to deal with flooding, uh, particularly in uh, towns like Listen Ski, totally uh, unaware of flooding. And that is down to problems that have arisen in terms of the Rivers Agency. And I think we will have to have uh, an, in an in depth look at what has occurred in those particular areas. There are other areas in Fermanagh uh, where, unfortunately, flooding is no stranger to them, and uh, particularly in Bow, they have had a horrific time. <coughs> and, uh, I will hope, uh, in terms of his answer, uh, that uh, all of the agencies will give support not only to householders but to schools, to community organisations and indeed to businesses, uh, not only to deal with the immediate aftermath but indeed to plan for the future. And I think that is what most of them will want to see. Is there an effective plan for dealing with this in the future? Mr Douglas, for a supplement. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Lord Morrow, I think, is going to table an urgent question about flooding, and particularly in the Linden Green shopping complex in, in Dungannon. Could the Minister um, outline what specific support there is uh, available for businesses? Well, at present, um, the DOE scheme, which actually was introduced when I was the DOE Minister back in 2007-2008, um, deals with householders. It does not deal with businesses at present, small businesses. And I know that the uh, Environment Minister uh, is looking to see whether that should be changed in the coming future. But, of course, many businesses will have um, insurance in place to deal with the issues. Uh, so, uh, and those that don't, uh, we will have to see how we can help them uh, moving into the future. But I really do think uh, that some of the causes of flooding could have been avoided. Uh, we need to look at that and we need to make sure that there's effective plans in place to ensure that that doesn't happen again. Mr. Alec Mask. Uh, Cooler, could I follow on from that question and thank the Minister for her responses so far and could I actually sympathise with many of her constituents in Fermanagh South Road in particular who have suffered uh, previously under the uh, storm Des Desmond. So, uh, could I ask the, the Minister if um, any of the businesses in particular may qualify for rates rebate? I understand that there is compensation made available as well, but in terms of the rates rebate? Well, it is probably too early to say whether they will qualify for rates rebate. Certainly, it will be something that the Department will look at if an application is forthcoming. Um, I have to say, I, I was thinking when I heard, we've only had, this is the fourth storm I think we've had named in Northern Ireland, and it's the first male. Um, it seems to have done more damage than the three females put together, but that's, that's a separate matter. Uh, but certainly it has caused a great deal uh, of pain and anguish to a lot of people right across, not just from Anand South Rome, but indeed uh, across the west of the province. Thank you for supplement. Uh, Carl Maggot, again, Mr Speaker. Um, again, thank the Minister. Would the Minister acknowledge that, uh, certainly in my own experience over the last number of years, that Belfast City Council has been a lead agency in terms of the, the response of both the homeowners and small businesses? So, uh, would the Minister be, I know she has alluded to the, the various agencies and departments working together, would it be useful if all other council areas, which may be starting to experience some of these difficulties as well, be able to avail of the expertise which has been accrued in Belfast City Council? Well, I'm a great believer in sharing expertise, and uh, I absolutely think that uh, Fermanagh and Oma Council, for example, should be pulling together all of the agencies and indeed learning uh, from other areas that have had to deal with specific instances of, of flooding. Um, we did have a, a very bad case of flooding back, you may recall, in 2009. Uh, we had a task force set up at that particular time when the former Minister of Agriculture, uh, Mrs Gildernew, and myself uh, were to the fore uh, at that particular point. But we need to look back at that task force report, see whether it was completely dealt with at that time. But I think it would be very useful if the lead agencies could come together in Fermanagh and Oma Council and work with other uh, councils if there is expertise there. 
Does the Minister agree that the rates re uh, revaluation process needs to be enshrined in legislation uh, so that the, we no longer have the 10-year uh, re revaluation uh, that, in my opinion, there has an adverse impact, effect, in fact, on businesses uh, who like to operate with certainty and with, uh, with less risk? Well, I, I do think that the um, revaluation needs to take place on a more uh, frequent basis than we had. Uh, I mean, 10 years is too long a period. Um, I think that is what has caused a lot of shock for some uh, retail businesses um, and indeed some other businesses right across Northern Ireland. Um, the revaluation is not to bring in more money to the department or the government, it's, it's neutral. Uh, there have been many people who have seen their rates fall quite significantly, but some have seen them rise quite significantly. And I think uh, in conversation uh, with some of the business organisations, they have made the case to me uh, that the revaluation should take place every three years. Um, I don't know whether that's a little too short, whether it should be five years, but certainly I think we need to have uh, more frequent revaluations than ten years. I think it is too long a period. Mr. Mullen for supplement. Can I thank the Minister for our answer thus far. Uh, would you agree with me that the rates re review needs to look at the reliefs that could uh, boost hospitality um, and help ensure uh, more growth and job creation in this area? Um, you know, to relieve the similar situation to that's happening. Where am I going? Well, certainly we'll work with any of the organisations that want to come forward with uh, new ideas that are sustainable uh, in the future. Uh, obviously, no one likes to pay rates. If we could get away without paying rates, I think we'd all be very pleased about that. But we do have to bring rates in uh, to our budget. I think last year uh, it was in the region of £1.17 five billion pounds come in through the rate system. Uh, that's money, of course, that we allocate out to public services, uh, and therefore we need to be able to recover that. And actually, the recovery rate uh, has increased, um, and we're pleased about that because for too long, uh, a lot of the um, rates processes weren't bringing forward people who were avoiding rates, and we're pleased to see that that has been dealt with effectively by LPS as well. Mr. Pat Sheehan. The Minister will be aware that the Halo Angel Investor Network in Belfast has contributed £10 million from local business people into startups. Does the Minister believe there is anything her department can do to incentivise this giving? Well, certainly, uh, it's more of a point really for my former department, the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment, where they were looking at how to encourage uh, start-up uh, and angel investors to become more involved. Northern Ireland really doesn't have uh, a good network of angel investors. We need to have more of that, and I very much welcome any interest that we can gain. Uh, in actual fact, I'm meeting a young man today who was a beneficiary of investment from an angel investor, and uh, he is doing great things. He's only 18 years of age, and uh, he's striving uh, with his uh, innovative uh, 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 app, I think it is, that he has. I'm meeting him later on today. And he's only been able to progress because of an angel investment. Mr. Sheehan, for a supplement. Would the Minister join with me in endorsing uh, uh, the actions of those individuals who have invested in startups through the, the Halo Network? but also uh, accept that it's worth exploring additional incentives towards crowdfunding and angel investing in startups. Carmel. Well, of course, I, I am happy uh, indeed to look at anything that comes forward from either the Department of Enterprise or indeed from the private sector as well. I work quite closely with the Northern Ireland Science Park uh, from my previous uh, role, and I've continued to do that uh, because I want to see more uh, investment not coming just from banks but coming from non-traditional methods as well because that gives more flexibility, uh, particularly for young people who may not be able to access finance from the traditional route. And Mr. Trevor Lunn is not in this place, so I move on to Mr. Alec Edward. And I'm afraid of only time for your original question. That's fine, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Or Mr. Speaker. Um, you may have been in the Chamber, Minister, uh, 45 minutes ago, when the Deputy First Minister referred to the legislative consent motion as, to use his words, a technicality. 
Given that that technicality, according to Mr McGuinness, surrendered welfare powers to London and saw this Assembly sign up to the Welfare Reform and Work Bill, which, among many things, will see a benefits freeze from 2016 to 2020, do you, Minister, think that the LCM, given all of that, was or was not a technicality? And given the, pre the difficulty of time, yes or no will do. Well, I, I want to congratulate the member of getting his question and all of his various points onto the uh, record. I'm sure it will be read with great interest by the people who it is meant to uh, target. As far as the LCM, I think it was the proper method uh, to uh, allow us to have the debate, one which he uh, took part in in great detail, uh, and I'm sure that the record reflects that. And we 